Good afternoon. My name is Evan Gates, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's presentation. The Dole Institute Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the work of the Dole Institute. We attend regular meetings, assist in events like this, and plan the SAB-sponsored programs every semester. Members of the Student Advisory Board receive great opportunities to network with our special guests. If you're a student and you'd like to join, please contact us. We would love to have you. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoyed today's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website email. If you prefer to write us a note, there will be notepads at the, and pens on the table as you leave. Your attendance and feedback help shape the future programming. Before I begin today, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the program, we'll have some time for audience question and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student helper with a microphone will come to you. Please ask just one brief question. And now, please, please help me welcome Dole Institute Director Bill Lacey. Thank you, Evan. Appreciate that very much. Uh, some of you asked me what's going on here tonight. That's what we call our partio. It's the party on the patio. It's what we do every uh, September to welcome back students. So this will be a big student night here. We'll have a bunch of them here hearing about the Dole Institute and learning about how they can be active in our student advisory board and active in a lot of our activities. So thank you all for coming out. This is our first uh, program of the new semester. If you had a chance to look at uh, the back of uh, the program describing our upcoming events, uh, you'll see some very impressive ones. I won't uh, take your time to go through all of those, but I will tell you one that is not on there yet, but one that you will not want to miss. On Monday, September 24th at 2.30, uh, the Dole Institute uh, and KU will have a rare visit by a sitting head of state. Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos will be here at the Dole Institute. 2.30 on September 24th, that will be a full house, so you'll wanna be here uh, when doors open uh, around one o'clock if you wanna get a seat for that event. Um, it should be a lot of fun. It's going to be a great semester with lots of emphasis on domestic politics, but also lots of very interesting uh, discussions about important books like today. Lawrence resident Tom Mack has written three successful historical novels, Sissy, All Parts Together, and today's book, Angels at Sunset. In 2001, uh, 2011, sorry, Sissy and All Parts Together were listed by the Kansas State Library as worthy to be included among the 150 all-time best Kansas books. In March, uh, in March of 2012, the state of Kansas issued a proclamation honoring Mr. Mack for his help in recognizing the 100th anniversary of the 1912 passage of Kansas suffrage by proclaiming this year in honor of his book, officially calling it the Kansas Angels at Sunset Centennial. Please welcome me in joining Tom Mack and welcoming Tom Mack to the Dole Institute of Politics. Tom? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I assume my mic is on. It is on. I hear myself talk. <clears throat> when I was coming here this, uh, this afternoon, one of the things that struck me was uh, how impressive this building is. Uh, the Dole Institute was. Uh, started here and actually broke ground in 1993. Uh, well, actually, uh, nine years ago, that make it, yeah, about that. And I was kind of surprised, though, when I, I've been here before, but on such a beautiful day, uh, seeing the, uh, uh, the pond and a, and a fountain and the, uh, especially the bricks with the people of who have uh, served our country so well. Some of them have died on a field. And in fact, one of the women I swim with, uh, uh, every, every week told me that her father was on D-Day. He didn't die on D-Day, but he survived it with a, with a pretty, uh, pretty bad wound and got the Purple Heart, and one of his bricks is, is listed on a pathway, shown in a pathway, and I couldn't find it. But that plus the fact that this uh, building also treasures a lot of memories of politicians who have served their country well, and I, I guess I'm kind of intimidated by the fact that there are so many good people who have done so well for so much for this country. Uh, so, and the other thing that I, I guess I'm kind of intimidated too is that uh, I've been looking at the posters on the walls 
seeing many of the famous people that have been here talking to various groups. And, uh, and when you are in such a uh, field of greatness, you feel rather intimidated by that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I can tell you this. I had, when I was younger, I had, no, I had a writer. I had interviewed Wallace Stegner, who's a Pulitzer Prize winner, winning author of Angle for Repose. I also uh, interviewed Alex Haley for two hours in his uh, uh, hotel room. And I can tell you it's very interesting being in, in close to, to, to greatness and where you feel, gee, these people really are human beings and uh, I guess I can relax because they're sort of like me in a way. Uh, so in that, with, that re with that beginning, I'd like to uh, also kick this off by telling you that uh, sometimes uh, I've heard that speakers sometimes can be so dull that the people who ask questions after a talk are really the, the brilliant ones. I hope I'm not in that situation today because I have a lot to talk about. I, I find especially um, authors like myself uh, find it difficult to talk, talk to an audience, but when they get emotionally carried away like I am about the subject of women's suffrage, the emotion takes over and the emotion kind of, kind of conquers the fear that you have. I uh, uh, watched on TV today uh, something that also sparked my interest. Uh, they were talking about women who uh, run for political office sometimes feel uh, they're, they're not treated fairly as men are when they run for political office. Uh, the commentators will talk about a woman's dress and her attire and how she uh, presents herself and, and any uh, liaisons they had with other men in the past and other personal things that uh, these commentators would not mention if they were male uh, political uh, per persons. And so um, that just shows you the degree of unfairness we have in our society today even. One of the questions I want to ask you, it's a, it's a tough question because I don't think you'll have an answer for it, is when was a woman not considered a, few, a full human being? Well, the answer is in the 19th century because as you might see in my poster here, in the 19th century, women were not allowed to sign contracts. Uh, they, if they owned property before they got married, uh, and uh, got divorced, they still didn't own that property. They no longer owned the property because the husband owned it all, even if it was a woman's property to begin with. Uh, if they d divorced, they, the man had a right to their, their children, not the, not the woman. And uh, so that's rather interesting because a lot of people aren't aware of that. Uh, they were dis also dis discouraged from public speaking. They were discouraged from going to college if they could even afford college. They were discouraged from having a profession. And also, they were not allowed to serve on a jury. So you can imagine a, a woman who was uh, convicted, uh, accused of some crime, she could not have uh, women in a jury uh, deciding whether or not she's guilty. Uh, finally, uh, women were not allowed to vote. And this is the most crucial part because if you can't vote, you can't make any changes to any laws which are repressive. Uh, they are subject to taxation and are subject to the laws that men make for them, but they have no vote in, in who represents them. Uh, in, in fact, you know, the, 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 ma the major part of the Revolutionary War, the thing that got people started and upset about, about what was happening was they had, what were being taxed without representation. Women were being taxed without representation. And it's interesting that, uh, uh, that back then, uh, people, men, and some women, didn't feel that was a problem. Uh, now, now, men, men back, back then did not want to give women the vote, however, they were interested in, in setting slaves free. They were interested in getting male uh, slaves citizenship and having males vote. But, uh, and, and it, there was a series of amendments too that really caught my eye. And there's three of them that you should be aware of. One is the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery. The next one is the 14th Amendment, which made everyone citizens regardless of race, but they added a section two to the 14th Amendment which said that uh, males had the right to vote. And they added that as an as a afterthought, saying that we don't want to upset the apple cart, we don't want, to, we, we don't want the women to vote, and we don't want them to, to interpret this uh, amendment as giving them that right. And then the 15th Amendment gave former black slaves, uh, male black slaves, the right to vote, and no mention again of women. So a few states, however, took it upon themselves, and I can tell you, say this, and some people, some people are not aware of this, that Kansas was the very first state to put, on, to put an amendment out that uh, suggested that women had a right to vote in their state. So Kansas put, was the first state to put that amendment. They lost, uh, but they did have the distinction of being the first to actually propose it. In uh, 1867, Susan B. Anthony, 
Elizabeth Case, Elizabeth Case Stanton, and others had uh, t taken a trek through Kansas trying to get the passage of uh, the suffrage amendment. Actually, there were two amendments going on at the same time. There was the Negro uh, suffrage amendment, and then there was the women's suffrage amendment, and uh, both failed. In fact, the women's suffrage amendment took a, quite a beating, was voted down two to one. Oh, by, by the way, this, this was mentioned in my book, which we'll get to later. So I'm giving you facts, but I'm also telling you that uh, many of these facts are mentioned in my book. In 1894, this is the second attempt to get uh, women the right to vote in Kansas. In 1894, women such as Carrie Chapman Catt, who later became the president of NASA, the North American Women's Suffrage Association, she and others would take, take the lead in uh, trying to get a, a, the suffrage amendment passed, but that failed. 1910, Catherine Hoffman, president of the Kansas Equal, Equal Suffrage Association, the KESA, decided that she's going to set up uh, office along with her officers in the headquarters at the Kansas State Historical Society in Topeka. And they did that, and they worked with the legislative uh, branch of the government, and they also got the cooperation of Governor Stubbs, who was very favorable towards the idea of, of passage of, of women's suffrage. In 1912, as you all know, the, uh, the, the amendment was adopted. So, 2012 is the 100th anniversary of the passage of Kansas suffrage. And uh, as a result, I thought, this is really great. I, I, I wrote the book, and I uh, eagerly sought the papers and looked at TV reports and whatever I could find to get my hands on. What are they saying about the centennial of Kansas suffrage? Nothing, not a zilch, nothing. I couldn't believe it. And I said, what is going on here? This is, they're talking about the sinking of the Titanic, the National Cherry Blossom Festival, the uh, anniversary of Fenway Park. These are all centennials, but nothing about Kansas suffrage? I mean, what is this? So I got kind of upset. I, you know, when I get, <laughs> get upset, I do things, such as write books. My other thing I do is, is I, I make calls, and I, also, I send emails. And I bothered the Kansas legislature saying, what's going on over here? How come no celebration of the, of the centennial? And finally, after much struggle on my part, uh, one of the representatives got back to me. She said, well, uh, we can uh, write a resolution. What, what would you want to say in a resolution? I said, well, I don't know. I can, I put, I'll put something together. She says, well, you've got to put it in the right framework. I says, I don't know what that is. She says, well, it's got to have a lot of whereas and all that. I said, I don't know anything about that. I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer. She said, well, put something together, and we'll take a look at it, and, and then we'll try to see if we can get it past the, the um, uh, representatives and then maybe get it adopted by the Senate. So said, okay, I put something together. So then I didn't hear anything from them. Come along March, I get an email from the, uh, the, the representative from the 10th district saying, ah, why don't you come to Topeka? She said, because uh, your resolution has been adopted, and what we'd like to do is, is be at the state uh, house of representatives if you can make it on March 23rd, and we'd also like you to meet the governor personally and talk to him. I said, okay, I can like, do that. So I came there, and I, they, uh, uh, they presented me with the, uh, the resolution, and, and uh, I mean, I told me what an honor it was that I was able to, to do this, and they, they named it uh, named it Centennial, in, in, uh, uh, according to Angel Sunset, they named it Angel Sunset Centennial for Kansas, which kind of shocked me. And um, then I met the governor, and then uh, and that was it. And I thought, well, now, now there'll be some news in the papers about that, nothing. <laughs> I had to actually write an article and said to, at least mention it to Lawrence Journal World, can you please say something about the fact this is centennial? Well, he finally did, and it was in a little article, and that was the only publicity I've ever seen about this event. Now, if you came across anything about the Kansas Centennial in the papers that you've seen, please let me know, because I'd be eager to read it. Um, the uh, book, Ancients of Sunset, is, a, uh, is actually two stories in one. Uh, I know some people in the audience here today Maybe, maybe you uh, aren't one of these people who says, I will never read a novel because a novel is fictitious. You made it up. You know, it, it, I, don't, I, read, I read real things. I read true history. Well, I got news for you. This is true history. And this, although this is not a history book, I've done a lot of digging and plowing. As a matter of fact, I put in the back of this book, you'll see a, bio, a bibliography. My wife actually suggest, suggested to me, she says, why don't you put, you got all these references. Why don't you mention in the book all the different places you saw that got a bibliography, all the references, Plus, my, uh, in my acknowledgments of people I talked to, uh, museums I visited, uh, articles I've seen, I put it all together, and I did, I did a lot of uh, cross-checking to be sure my facts are correct, and I, I put this together in, in part of my novel, but I also put it in a story, because I felt 
if you're just going to read a history book, maybe some of you will say, well, it's going to be kind of dull and boring. Uh, I can tell you this, I did read a history on uh, the suffrage movement, and I did find it boring because I find that uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about different amendments and on and off and, and, and changes in, their, in the, the, how you rewrite a resolution and the places they travel and, and how many days they stayed over and where they stayed. And I said, well, this is really boring. I mean, this might be historical, but I'm going to, my, I'm going, my eyes are getting drowsy. And I want, I want a story that makes me want to turn the pages and I want to read more. So what I did is I, I added a, a fictional thread to the, to the book. The fictional thread uh, concerns a woman named Jessica Radford. Now, if any of you have read my other two books, that name is familiar to you. Jessica Radford is a very independent, self-sufficient female who was uh, uh, centuries ahead of her time. She would be very comfortable in the 21st century, but she lived back in the 19th century. So she's really, really ahead of her time. Uh, she, she knows at the very onset that women should be equal to men in all respects and that uh, uh, she doesn't like men treating her like she's some dainty, fluffy marshmallow. She wants to be on equal terms, and that gets her into a lot of trouble. In this third book that I wrote, this is part of a trilogy, in the third book I wrote, Angel of Sunset, uh, she's got a final cause that she wants to get into. Her final cause is the women's suffrage movement. Her prior cause was, the, was Negro suffrage, and, and also in ab abolition men. She was a uh, very, very much uh, involved in the abolitionist movement when, when uh, slaves were not free, and she wanted to do all she can to make that, make that change. Uh, these, um, these novel, the novel that I wrote uh, intersperses a storyline with history, and I do this in a very interesting way, uh, in that I, uh, my chapter numbers, I got chapters, you know, chapter one, two, three, four, five, those chapters will talk about a story that's taking place in 1920. Then you get into uh, other chapters, which, in, which are uh, really, res really respect, uh, 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 really uh, the, uh, uh, represent the uh, book that her daughter, Emma, is writing about her biography about Jessica. So when you get this uh, chapter that talks about the history going back in the suffrage movement, you're, you're going back in time because Jessica is reading her biography that Emma wrote about herself. So uh, you're, getting, uh, you're getting history when you get to those pages and you're going back to 1920 when you're getting to the present moment, which is, the, which is where the novel begins. So if you, uh, what I should say is if you're seeking history, you will get it in Angel of Sunset. If you're seeking for an interesting story, you'll get it in Angel of Sunset. Uh, that being said, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the story uh, and uh, g give you a little bit about the background of what this is uh, all about. Uh, oh, as an aside, I forgot to mention on these three books, Sissy, All Parts Together, and Angel of the Sunset. Uh, I was trying to think of a way you can argue, when you leave here today and you want to think about what, what books did Mr. Mack write again, uh, I have an easy way for you to remember. Uh, you can think of a, 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 a lady named Sissy. After an operation, Sissy got up after operation. She looked at herself, found all parts together, and was relieved because yesterday she thought she saw Angel of the Sunset. So now you can remember the three books. Um, now, here's the background of the story. Jessica Radford has two daughters. One daughter is Emma, one daughter is uh, Mitzi. Emma is the one who writes a biography of her mother. The other daughter is Mitzi, but Mitzi is killed in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. Uh, Negro, uh, Jessica ha ha hates a particular Negro musician named Devin Alcott because Devin Alcott eloped with Mitzi took her to Chicago, and, uh, when, uh, and since uh, Jessica was living at Evanston at the time, she went to Chicago to try to find her daughter. She found her daughter all right, but uh, she found, what she found was that Devin Alcott was running away from her daughter, and just before a building collapsed and killed her daughter. So she, uh, at that point, she decides that Devin Alcott is a coward, and she hates him because she feels that he could have done something to save her life. Uh, now, through a previous marriage, Devin has a son named Michael. Michael is a very gifted violinist. In fact, Michael is a concerto, he's a violin, uh, I don't know how you, uh, he is a, uh, uh, he's a perfectionist in terms of the violin. He's a, he's a, he's a uh, violinist that uh, people will pay money to see all over the world. As a matter of fact, I was trying to uh, recall the name of this person. I wrote it down on paper so I wouldn't forget. Uh, there was a violinist named, um, George, uh, 
Bridge Tower. I don't know if you heard of George Bridge Tower. George Bridge Tower lived from 1780 to 1820. He was such a violin virtuoso that he personally met Ludwig von Beethoven, and Beethoven dedicated the sonata for violin and piano to this uh, George uh, Bridge Tower. That's how famous he was. Uh, the, the violinist I have in my novel was like Bridge Tower. He was very famous. He was very, he at, at uh, a younger age, like in his early 20s, he was already commanding audiences. So uh, what is important about that is that uh, years later, <clears throat> a Michael is discovered with a, with a girlfriend of his uh, at, 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 a, uh, at a place where there was a, there's a, a they're near the top of, of a tall a hill. And uh, they're having an argument, and Jessica happens to be there witnessing this, and he, he, she sees or she thinks she sees him push her over the cliff, and she dies whilst her dead. <clears throat> she then uh, becomes a witness <clears throat> to this and uh, uh, convinces a jury that Michael deliberately pushed his, his, his girl to her death, and so Michael is convicted to a life sentence in prison. Uh, later, the sentence is overturned, uh, and uh, he's free, <clears throat> but Jessica does not know that. And Jessica going about her merry way in 1920, not realizing that Michael is out to get her and to kill her and her family. Uh, so there's a little tension involved there. So as, as um, Jessica is leaving uh, her son's residence, her son is, lives in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and she leaves uh, with her son, her son-in-law, her daughter, and her uh, granddaughter uh, from, uh, uh, from Pennsylvania to Kansas. Uh, the, uh, Michael is trailing her. But while, he, while he, that's happening, she's reading a biography of herself, and she goes back in the past through the biography in terms of her uh, years as a suffragist. Uh, the, uh, and I, I'm going to get into what happens after that, because I think you'll find it very interesting how this thing, thing you know, ends, because you've got, a, you've got tension happening there in the present tense in 1920, but then you also have a lot of tension happening in the past in terms of her life as a suffragist. Um, I'm going to now show you a few excerpts of the, uh, oh, by the way, before I get into that, uh, I did want to show you what this looks like. This is the uh, House Resolution uh, 6020 that uh, uh, is, is uh, announcing the fact that this is the centennial of the women's uh, suffrage movement. And uh, it's very interesting. I have actually, uh, I'm going to frame this. I haven't framed it yet, but I, I've gotten, uh, uh, it's too, too boring to read, so I can read it to you. But it basically says that this, we're honoring women who, Oh, who bravely fought for the right to vote, and they finally won, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a, good, uh, it's a good thing to have. I'm so glad that I was a part of it, and I was glad to get something, uh, something accomplished for the, for the state, if not through the media. Uh, let me first, let me go through the uh, sections of this book. Now, what I'm going to do, this is very difficult. When, when I had to choose sections of the book, I thought to myself, what should I do? Because there's a lot of things in here that I think you'd be interested in, but I can only say so many things about the book without going overboard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you sections of the book that involve the suffrage uh, movement. I'm also going to give you a little humor that's in, included in the book. I'm also going to tell you a little bit about the present tense in 1920 involving Jessica. <clears throat> We're going to start off with the page 20. <clears throat> in 1920, you're in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and Jessica, who is now 78 years old, is at her son Hubert's house. And she's just finished listening to the first radio broadcast of the 1920 presidential election, and uh, is very upset about the fact that her candidate did not win. So um, we can go to page 20 now for that. I'm going to listen in on what. Angels the, uh, at Sunset, page 20, second paragraph. Jessica tossed the headphones on the desk. Such uninformed voters electing a ne'er do well like Mr. Harding. I will wager women only voted for Mr. Harding because of their dislike of Mr. Wilson's stubbornness in resisting our suffrage amendment. But we did win Wilson over to our cause, and he did help us defeat Germany and actually saved civilization. Don't these women realize we had to fight the enemy? What have we become, milksops? Hubert gently placed both hands on her arm. Take it easy, mother. I know how much you wanted a Cox Roosevelt victory, but it just didn't happen. She rose up in indignation, causing his hands to drop helplessly to his side. I've wasted my vote, and I've wasted my time trying to get my friends to vote for the right candidate. But you voted, Mother. For the first time in your life, you voted. Indeed, Hubert was right, she thought. 
She remembered pulling the curtain of the voting booth behind her before focusing on the choices offered on the voting machine, offices for the county, the state legislature, and the most important office of all, the President of the United States. Forty-eight years ago, she recalled, Susan B. Anthony cast a ballot in this state of New York, and she was arrested and convicted. Too bad that wonderful crusader didn't live to see this day. Jessica wandered around the room, poking the end of her cane into the plush carpeting with each thoughtful step she took. Her face drawn, her eyes glassy, she came to a stop before him, leaning with both hands on her cane as if it was a royal scepter. Seventy-two years, she thought. Seventy-two years from the signing of the Declaration of Independence to Elizabeth Cady Stanton's first Women's Rights Convention. And then it took another 72 years beyond that for the United States to ratify the 19th Amendment. Jessica's face soured. 144 years. Hubert frowned. What's that, Mother? Never mind. Are you all right? I am more than all right, her eyes brightened. Do you know something, Hubert? That felt truly good. What felt good? Voting. Enjoying a privilege that women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony did not live long enough to enjoy. <clears throat> There's also a little humor I included in this chapter. Uh, when she, uh, she's reflecting when they, she first voted, uh, she was uh, approached by a man, and she had a ballot in her hand, and the man said, uh, I bet you don't even know the difference between W. Cox, who's running for the socialist ticket, and J. Cox, who's running for the Democrats. She stared at him, and with a devious grin, added, and you don't even know you're on zip, mister. And he looked at himself in embarrassment. So I do have some humor in here, so you have a little bit of a, a mix between humor and uh, seriousness. And on uh, another page in this uh, story, uh, we're talk we got a meeting between uh, Emma, uh, Jessica's daughter, and Kevin, the publisher of Emma's biography, and her mother, Jessica. So the three of them, uh, Kevin, Emma, and Jessica, are seen at dinner at a restaurant. And uh, this is an interesting scene because this is going to in indicate how this suffrage amendment ha happened to get uh, passed. What, what, happened to ha what had to happen? So here's page 146. Angels at Sunset, page 146, second line from the top. Well, Kevin said, turning to Emma, I was quite impressed by the outline and sample chapters you sent me earlier. It's obvious you've taken great pains to solicit specific details of your mother's life. I am particularly interested in your thoughts on how your mother helped get the 19th Amendment passed. It must have been quite a struggle. While Emma thought about how to answer his question, Jessica added, I think the word battle might have been even a more fitting description. Kevin directed his gaze at her. Quite a battle indeed. I happened to be in Tennessee visiting with my mother when 35 states ratified the amendment and the country waited for Tennessee to make its decision. My mother was sure Tennessee was going to vote for the amendment. Oh, how could she be sure of that? Jessica asked. She knew Fee Byrne, Harry's mother, Harry, as you know, was the Tennessee legislator who voted yay on the amendment. Mrs. Burns told my mother about a telegram she had sent him. I'm paraphrasing, but it went something like this. Be a good boy and help Carrie Chapman, C-A-T-T, -T, put the R-A-T in ratification. And he did. The rest is history. <clears throat> now, none of that is fiction. I'm, that's all based on actual fact. That, that did happen, and... Is the 19th Amendment was very close to failing, so good thing for the Tennessee uh, 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 person to, to, to listen to his mother and to, to take her advice and to actually uh, vote for the amendment. Uh, another page I've got here is the one that discusses uh, uh, Elizabeth K. Elizabeth Stanton at Fraser Hall. Yeah, she was at Fraser Hall and was Susan B. Anthony was also in 1867. Remember I mentioned earlier that they were traveling through Kansas in 1867 to get the... Uh, uh, get the uh, support for the amendment. So uh, both Stanton and, and Anthony both went through Kansas, uh, stopping at Lawrence for a while and going on west, uh, going as far as Junction City and going places south. 
Uh, I've actually got a map that indicates where they, all the places they went to. So quite a bit of the north, northeastern part of the, of the state. Um, anyway, she's, uh, Elizabeth Gay Stanton has uh, been just been introduced as speaker in support of the proposed suffra women's suffrage amendment for Kansas. From here on out, Stanton and, and Susan B. Anthony uh, will trek to Kansas to support the support for the Kansas suffrage amendment. So here goes page 88. Angels at Sunset, page 88, fourth paragraph. After she is formally introduced, Elizabeth Cady Stanton speaks for an hour to the crowd. The plight of womanhood cannot and will not be forgotten. We are all citizens of this country, men, white or colored, and women, white or colored. We are not asking, but we are demanding the right to vote, as that right is our entitlement. A mixture of cheers with some boos erupted from the audience, but Mrs. Stanton continues with her emotional oratory. Miss Anthony then takes the platform and speaks of the need for those who favor Negro suffrage to have a discourse with those favoring female suffrage. We need to hear both sides of these arguments, Anthony concludes, and hopefully we will find the righteousness of both causes. Now many of you are probably aware of this if you know your uh, suffrage history, but uh, uh, you probably know that Susan B. Anthony was arrested for voting. Now, she had three sisters, they all voted, but Susan B. Anthony was the one arrested because they wanted to make an example of her. So in June of 1873 in Canadagua, New York, Jessica is talking to Susan B. Anthony hours after Susan was convicted for voting. And here we go on page 239. Angels at Sunset, page 239, third paragraph. Our government does not appreciate being intimidated. It undoubtedly wanted to make an example out of me and issue a warrant for my arrest. Miss Anthony smiled broadly. Poor fellow. Who? that unfortunate deputy U.S. Marshal who came to arrest me. I never saw a man so outrageously nervous telling me that the commissioner wished to arrest me and that I would come to the courthouse when I was able. I insisted on being arrested, and when I offered my limbs for the handcuffs, he told me he did not think it was necessary. When I got on the horse car, and the conductor asked for my fare, I told everyone aboard that I was a prisoner and that the government should pay that fare. Bravo, Jessica exclaims. But one thing did not go well for me. I had always hoped that by applying for a writ of habeas corpus, I could challenge the government's right to hold me a prisoner since I had not committed a crime. However, Mr. Shelton felt he was acting chivalrously by posting my bail. Yet, by doing so, I lost my chance to have my case get to the Supreme Court. By the way, I should mention, this is some interesting fact you may not be aware of. Mr. Selden was Susan B. Anthony's attorney, but Mr. Selden was also a, a Lincoln's first choice on, as a vice presidential candidate. For the, second, for the second time he ran for office, Mr. Selden was the one that he initially wanted to run as his vice president. A lot of people don't know that. I found it, you find a lot of interesting things when you dig through history. Um, now, we, now we're back in July... 4th, 1876, it's the centennial of the Declaration of Independence, very, very historical thing taking place in Philadelphia. Um, after, after someone reads the Declaration of Independence aloud to the crowd, Susan B. Anthony and her followers hand out copies of the Women's Declaration of Rights and they are quickly escorted out of the hall. Can you, can you imagine the scene? They're, they get up there and people are shocked. You know, here's this, they're passing out this literature and, and uh, Gently, these women are escorted out of the hall. You, you can't do this over here. You know, they go outside the hall there. So they recongregate outside the hall. They go to another place where they, it's sunny outside and people are holding umbrellas over the, over the heads of the speakers outside. And uh, undaunted, Susan B. Anthony and other suffragists re are reassembled and they, they, they talk together and crowd outside the hall. So here's page 251 to show you what happened. Angels at Sunset, page 251 top of the page. Susan B. Anthony begins listing the articles of impeachment from the Declaration of Rights for Women. By introducing the word male in all of the state constitutions, the government has, in effect, made one sex a crime. 
the writ of habeas corpus does not apply to married women as their rights are secondary to that of their husbands. There is no such thing as trial by jury of one's peers as far as women are concerned. Taxation without representation, unequal codes for men and women, no right to the joint earnings of a marriage partnership. Miss Anthony next says something that deeply stirs Jessica's heart. When the slave power was dominant, the Supreme Court decided that a black man was not a citizen because he had not the right to vote. When the Constitution was so amended as to make all persons citizens, the same high tribunal decided that a woman, though a citizen, had not the right to vote. Jessica recalls her earlier years when she had fought so hard for the freedom of slaves and for the right of former slaves to become citizens. It seems all too obvious to her that a woman is viewed as half citizen and half slave. Uh, food for thought, isn't it? Uh, I wanted to show you a little humor in here too. I, you know, it's interesting, when I was trying to determine which sections to read and which not to read, uh, I thought, well, I'll put a little humorous episode in here because I wanted you to see, there's a point to be made here, but it's also kind of interesting, it's humorous as well. Uh, it's 1920 and Francesco, Francesco, by the way, is, uh, is Jessica's son-in-law, Emma's husband, Emma, Ann, who's uh, Jessica's granddaughter, and Jessica have just left Columbia, uh, Missouri, on their way to Lawrence, Kansas. They're, they're traveling by car, they're driving in this 1918 Maxwell, and it's taking forever to get there. I mean, for one thing, you know, there's, there's hardly any roads, and they can keep getting lost. You know, I can, I can hardly find a gas station, because it's very rare to find a gas station in 1920. And uh, they're getting lost. Uh, on top of it, uh, Jessica wants to go to different places. I want to go to St. Louis, now I want to go to Chicago. But it, it, takes, them, it takes them a couple weeks to get to Kansas. <laughs> And, uh, and of course, getting very upset because it's taking us forever. And when are we going to get here already? But, you know, we keep on going, going. Anyway, they just left Columbia, Missouri. And uh, let me sh uh, show you what happens here. This is going to be a kind of a little humorous thing, but there's a point to be made. Uh, page uh, 267. Angels at Sunset, page 267, sixth line from the top. After they left Columbia, Missouri, the next day, Francisco began to snicker. Then he burst out laughing. Emma gave him an odd stare. Are you going to share the joke with us, or are you going to keep it to yourself? I read this one in newspaper, Francisco said, glancing toward Jessica in the rear of the automobile. You would have liked this one, too. Let's hear it, then. Well, this man, a long time ago, he walk along Lake Michigan, and he pray and pray. He say out loud, Lord, please grant me my one wish. The clouds in the sky, they open up. The Lord say, O oh son, because you believe in me, I will grant you one wish. Just tell me what you want, and I will grant it. The man, he say, Lord, please build for me a bridge to cross this big lake so I can ride my horse and carriage over it. Then the Lord, he say, that is very, very difficult. I got to make supports to reach the bottom of the lake, and it takes lots and lots of material and a time to make. Of course I can do it, because I can do anything, but why not make a simpler wish instead and not be so selfish? The man, he think about it and think about it. Oh, he say, I know what, it is something good. What is it, son, the Lord says. Well, Lord, the man says, I truly feel bad for women because they get a no vote. They have the, no rights if they get a divorce. The men not give them pay for same work. They don't get a, the same education. And men look at them like they inferior. Lord, change it so that by tomorrow, everybody, the whole world, will see that women and men should be treated the same way in all respects. After a minute or two, God said, you want to want a lane or two for that bridge? Jessica was still laughing when Anne tapped her on the shoulder. I don't think God speaks with an Italian accent. I bet he does. Emma leaned back and sighed. I wonder if Mrs. Stanton and Miss Anthony would have appreciated the humor in that. Probably not. They probably would have wondered if God was deaf to prayer. He not deaf, Francesco said. We need to listen better. I put that in there because I thought it might be uh, interesting change of direction and where this thing is going. Uh, so it is now, now back to 1912, December 1912, Jessica's on a train 
and she's going in to see a suffragist Alice Paul. I guess some of you are familiar with Alice Paul. She's a, she's a major figure in the suffrage movement. And uh, knowing Jessica, she's going to do anything she can to get that the, the suffrage movement going. So she's going to go. She's going to be going to uh, Washington D.C. to meet up with Alice Paul. And uh, she's thinking about you know what she's going to say, what she's going, what can she do, how can she work with her. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll start. Let's start with page uh, 304, and I'll go from there. Page 304. Angels at Sunset, page 304, third paragraph. When the train conductor announces the next stop, Jessica decides she will have enough time to reread the letter she received from Emma earlier this year. It glowed with enthusiasm. Dear Mother, Francesco and I enjoy our new home in Lawrence, Kansas, and it is quite a change from Peoria, Illinois. You probably won't recognize the town if you ever come to visit. Lawrence is in the progress of changing the names of its east-west streets and doing what it can to promote more business here. I was intrigued to learn that although Kansas has always been recognized as an anti-slavery state, voters have twice turned down a women's suffrage amendment. You were in Kansas when it was defeated the first time in 1867. Then it was defeated again in 1894. Now another amendment is coming up for a vote for a third time. Fortunately, I was in Lawrence on the evening of May 6th when June Adams gave a talk to a capacity crowd at the Bowerstock Theater. The Equal Suffrage Association invited her because she was a recent convert to the suffrage cause. I admire what she did for Chicago's Hull House project in getting settlement houses for the poor. Her talk on suffrage was inspiring. She made a particularly interesting observation about a woman's desire for a political voice. She said men think it's nice for women to do philanthropic things, but as soon as she wants controlling power to continue her work, men claim it is unladylike. What are men afraid of? Anyway. Her talk gave me the impetus to join the Kansas Equal Suffrage Association, KESA, and help improve chances for securing approval for a new suffrage amendment for Kansas. I became involved in recruiting members for KESA and in raising money by selling orange balloons with the words, Votes for Women, lettered on them. I hope the voters pass this amendment. We have put considerable effort into this program. Love, Emma. Now, in this next scene, I wanted to get, see if you can use your imagination on this. It's, it's November of 1917. Uh, the, uh, it's already months after uh, uh, President Wilson had announced war against Germany. Uh, prior to that, women were parading up and down with large pickets and banners in front of the White House. Uh, they were virtually ignored. President Wilson would, would, would go by and just maybe give a quick glance and you know just ignore them. And uh, people generally ignored them. There were some boos and things, but they're nothing really major. But then after, after the war was declared against Germany, things changed. Uh, women were still going to be uh, uh, parading with their signs in front of the White House, but it was different now because now the United States was at war. And uh, people look at scorn at these women. What are they doing? They're being so uh, un-American. Uh, they should be uh, worried about the war effort. We have to win this uh, war against Germany. Why are they picketing for a selfish cause like suffrage? So they were getting a lot of obnoxious stares. They were getting, uh, their people were throwing things to them, hissing at them, uh, cussing at them. All kinds of nasty things were being done. Finally, the police arrived. The police didn't know what to do because they couldn't arrest them for picketing. So what they did, they arrested them for an outlandish charge of blocking traffic, obstructing traffic, or you know whatever, and making a nuisance, being a public nuisance. So they would arrest these women. They'd bring them to court. And then uh, there'd be a, a, one, a, a jury, of, um, a judge, no jury. And uh, they, the judge would basically say, you know, you're guilty, and that's the fine is fifty dollars, hundred dollars, whatever it is. And someone would say, okay, I pay the fine, and leave. And other women would say, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you're gonna do what, what you have to, but I'm not gonna go to, no, I'm not gonna change my mind. I'm, what I did was perfectly legal. So these women went to uh, a place called the uh, Cochran uh, uh, Workhouse in in uh, Lorne, Lorton, Virginia. Workhouse means it's a pretty prison, and it's an awful prison. And uh, I can, uh, uh, this next reading will show you, give you some indication of it, but I can go into much more detail in my book about what it was like, and it was an awful place. Uh, 
And, and uh, in this prison, Jessica, serving out her sentence for obstructing traffic, uh, made up charge, and she witnesses another uh, suffragist she, whom she uh, is familiar with, Lucy Burns. And Lucy Burns is a, is a historical figure, uh, very much a, a, a a, a partner of Alice Paul, and Alice Paul was also in prison as well. So here's uh, page 345. Angels at Sunset, page 345, third paragraph from the bottom. Jessica is surprised to see Lucy Burns so frail in a torn gray and white striped uniform. Her thin arms are crossed, and her red hair is damp and stringy. Mrs. Bolton and another matron order them to make even rows like a military formation. The superintendent wants to see for himself what scum looks like, she shouts almost gleefully. Within moments, a tall, lanky man with sallow cheeks and a balding head bursts into the room. Following him are 20 or 30 guards. His eyes glare with fury as he puts his hands behind his back and paces down the long line of prisoners. I'm not going to put up with this nonsense anymore, understand? He stops in front of Lucy Burns, who looks straight ahead, as if he were not even present. So, you're the ringleader, he said. I don't like ringleaders. He turns to the uniformed guards nearby. Take care of her. One guard grabs her by the hair, while the other handcuffs her hands behind her back. Make an example of her, Whitaker yells. Chain her to the cell bars with her hands up high. Let her spend the night that way. The guards drag Lucy by the armpits out of the room with the heels of her shoes scraping the floor. You're hurting her, a woman with a lame leg and about Jessica's age says. Don't do that. Are you giving me orders? Whitaker signals two burly guards to grasp her arms as well and pull her out the door. My leg, she cries. I'll go willingly, but don't hurt my leg. The other women watch as her cries are ignored. They begin buzzing with alarm, some crying, some pleading with the guards not to hurt them. There are other abuses in this prison as well, which are mentioned in this book about uh, a woman being pushed into prison. Uh, one woman hit her head against a wall. Another one had a heart attack. Uh, some were sent to the hospital. And uh, news soon arrived. Uh, the, the newspapers called winter this, and they... Uh, they made a big story about this and embarrassed the hell out of Wilson. And Wilson had to go up to the Congress and say, you know, I wasn't aware that we had this problem and we'll have to see what we can do about it. And uh, he then at that point helped uh, support a suffrage amendment. But it took a lot of uh, pain and suffering before he got to that point. Uh, there are other events mentioned here. I mentioned just, a, I just barely scratched the surface in his book. And I want to mention to you some of the things that are in his book that I didn't describe, but they're also in his book as well such as the fact that George Francis Strain supported a suffrage newspaper called The Revolution. Uh, there was a split in two of the two women's associations. There was the American Suffrage Association and the National Suffrage Association. The American des decided that they wanted to go by state by state basis, and the National said we want to go for a federal, legis a federal uh, uh, amendment. Uh, the Northwest journey for passage of suffrage in Oregon and Washington. Washington almost passed suffrage, but they missed it by one vote because one of the legislators said that we got to give uh, uh, Indian women the right to vote, and we got to make a specific uh, exception for Indian women. So because of that, he decided not to vote for the, for the passage, and, and, women, and Washington law did not pass it at that point. Uh, Victoria Woodhull, the first woman ever to run for president in, of the United States, interesting story about Victoria Woodhull. She actually uh, uh, embarrassed the uh, NASA, the National American Association, because she she crashed her, their, their meeting. She came to the mic and she started talking. And uh, uh, Susan B. Anthony wanted to shut her up so she could do it physically. So what she did, she turned off all the lights and all the electricity. So everything got, the room got darkened until she decided, well, she better leave. And that was the way uh, Victoria Woodhull had to leave. And at that point, Victoria Woodhull formed her own party and put herself down as president and named Frederick Douglass as vice president. But Frederick Douglass said, I don't want any part of this thing. What she did was not right, and I'm, I'm not going to be part of her her thing, so she, he, she, and there it failed. She got a few votes, but it wasn't very many. Then there was Frances Willard and the temperance movement. Uh, the International Council of Women in 1888, where women from all over the country, from all over the world, came to assemble. Uh, and uh, then there was Elizabeth Cady Stanton publishing the Women's Bible, because Stanton felt that uh, the Bible was too, uh, 
uh, male-centered, and she wanted to, sh to bring women into this, this uh, thing, so she redid the Bible. She got a lot of hostility from that. I mean, people really were upset. How could, she, how could she rewrite the Bible? The Bible is a sacred word of God. You don't change it. Uh, so she got a lot of flack for that one. Stanton's death in, in 1902, Anthony's death in 1906, the rise of Alice Paul into the position of influence, the 1913 Washington suffrage parade, I go into great de detail about that, how they, women were persecuted but just by just showing up for a parade. It happened to be the same day that Wilson was being inaugurated, so that made, a, made she wanted to make a point. And uh, as a result, people didn't like that, and they got a lot of uh, hostility for marching that same day. Suffragists picking in the White House, we mentioned that. The rest of suffragists who picked the White House uh, after Wilson declared war. Then a spirited suffragist named Ellis Paul spoke at the Bowersock Theater. Bowersock Theater is Liberty Hall, by the way. It was Bowersock Theater back then. She spoke at Liberty Hall in 1912 in May. So uh, there are lots of, we live in an interesting town. This is a very historical town we live in. It's not, it's not only a, a Civil War town where things happen when Underground Rail was involved, but there's also something about the suffrage involved, too. There's famous speeches being made here. So we ought to be really proud of, of this town. Um, a few other things that I mentioned in this book, <clears throat> such as the start of the Ku Klux Klan in, 19, in 1866 in Tennessee. I have a chapter showing how the Ku Klux Klan operated back then. And uh, for a while it was shut down. When Grant became president, he shut down the Ku Klux Klan, but then he rose again. Uh, Sojourner Truth, I don't know if you're familiar with Sojourner Truth. She was a former black slave. She was the first one to integrate trolley cars. Uh, she, in the Mad chapter, I show how she integrated white only horse horn trolleys. So, uh, Kudos to her. She was, she was successful. She'd get thrown off a few times, but she kept with it. Uh, Frederick Douglass's Frederick Douglas's, uh, minimization of the greater importance of Negro suffrage than, than uh, female suffrage. He had a big argument about that, that you know, women can come later. You know, it's Negroes who've got to get their suffrage men first, and then women. And uh, a lot of women were upset by that, by, the, by his change, of course, because initially Douglass supported women's suffrage, but then they came to the Negro suffrage. He said, that's got to take preeminence. Uh, so then we're going to go to the last paragraph. Now, before I go into the last paragraph, I've got to give you a little background because this is where it becomes quite important. Uh, I told you that uh, Michael uh, is a uh, gifted violinist, a virtuoso, and he is, uh, he's, he's been in prison for 25 years. He's, he's lost his ability to play the violin. He's trying to relearn it again, but it's very difficult. And uh, he's, he's, he's out to kill. He's out for murder. He uh, has made several attempts on uh, Jessica's life, but they've all failed. Now... He's out of prison. He's, he's at in St. Lawrence at a, at a high school uh, musical uh, thing that uh, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but Francesco is in charge of a musical program at, the, at this high school where he's doing a Christmas concert and he's doing a rehearsal that day. And it's uh, December 18, 1920, and he's doing the rehearsal and uh, uh, Michael happens by and he's gonna, do, he's gonna carry out his plan. So we're, we're on page 362 and here's what happens. Angels at Sunset, page 362, last paragraph. Okay, Francisco said after the conclusion of the musical, we are now going to have the choir sing the last five measures again, but first we take a break. Nice performance, except for you, Sandra, needs work. Disappointment shone through Sandra's blue eyes. You don't like it, Mr. Bonelli? Well, he said, scratching his chin, you not make music sound like angel voices. Try again. Sir, a Negro man said, trotting down the aisle toward the stage. I know what she's doing wrong. Francesco's eyes widened. You, Michael Alcott, what you doing here? Mind if I give your violinist some pointers? Francesco was both stunned and confused. He wondered if this was a ruse and looked carefully to see if Michael had a weapon. His heart raced. He ought to call the police. Yeah, give pointers, he said cautiously. But I don't want trouble. Understand? No trouble. Don't worry. Francesco grumbled as he headed for the wall telephone. He dialed a number and asked for the police department, but Michael pressed down the receiver. Please hang up, Mr. Bonelli. Why are you here? Francisco asked, his voice shaking as he replaced the telephone on its receiver. As I said, I just want to give your student violinist some help. He turned his attention to Sandra and asked her to hand him her violin and bow. You see, he told her, pressing the chin rest of her violin under his neck, you need to get softer sounds using lighter pressure on the bow. 
He stroked the bow evenly against one of the strings. You do this by drawing the bow closer to the fingerboard. Now, you try it. Sandra took the violin and bow and began playing. That's fine, Michael said, his voice getting louder and more irritable. But don't grip the bow tightly like you have been doing. On your bow returns, you should... He turned his frustrated face toward Francisco. Mr. Bonelli, would you mind asking them to stop? Who? Your choir. Have them stop. I know they sing beautifully. In fact, I've never heard such a wonderful chorus in my life, but I cannot talk to your student and listen to them caroling at the same time. Francisco frowned. He looked at the students in the choir. Three of them were leaping through their songbooks. Two were whispering to one another. The rest were staring off into space. Snowflakes drifted across the high windows. Illuminated by the moon, they formed white triangles against the corners of the panes. Except for a few teachers sitting in the front row, the auditorium seats were empty, and those in the rear of the room were shaded in darkness. Francisco blinked at a curious pattern of light by the rear auditorium door. It was bright and had the shape of an angel. No, such foolishness. One of the ceiling lights is on, that's all. He looked at the musicians who were engaged in silently reading their sheet music. Then he shifted his attention back to the students in the choir. They were just as quiet as everyone else in the room. Don't you hear them? Michael asked, his face brightening. They sound just like angels. Francisco's brow wrinkled as he paused to reflect. Many years ago, his father Enrico had told him about a certain theologian named Francis de Sales. According to Enrico, de Sales instructed us to make ourselves familiar with the angels and behold them frequently in spirit, for without being seen they are present for you. Francesco still believed that somehow, in some mysterious way, angels had a positive influence on the development and performance of great music. How else could Beethoven have written his best music while he was totally deaf? How else could Mozart have composed symphonies as a mere child? Angels, yes, angels. They had to be an influence. He was certain of it. Finally, nodding in understanding, he gazed at Michael. It has been a long time since you heard them, Mr. Alcott, hasn't it? Michael pressed his hand against his chin as he closed his eyes. He took in a deep breath and exhaled slowly. Yes, a very long time. Now this, this uh, chapter will make more sense to you if you realize that Michael at the beginning, when he was a virtuoso, uh, when he played, he played, he said, this sounds just like the music of angels. And he's lost that when he went to prison comes back and he hears it again. So it's kind of a chilling, uh, uh, good feeling at the end of that story. Um, here's, a, by the way, I, I guess uh, the way I want to also mention is this book is uh, uh, certainly a book of the suffrage movement, but it's also a book of love and forgiveness and tied in together. And uh, I don't know if uh, people, you know, how people will respond to that, but I feel you're getting the best of both because cer certainly uh, the anger and or frustration of, of the suffrage movement is something that, you know, that just makes us really, really upset, made me upset when I, when I heard all, when I read all about what was going on. But also I wanted to promote a, a message of love and forgiveness because that's, that's the only way we can bring things together. And one of, one of the music pieces that I put in this uh, uh, book was uh, something come from Beethoven's Oath of Joy. And uh, maybe we can, uh, I think I've got uh, the man behind her can play a few bars of the, uh, the music. But I might also read you a few quotes from people who are ready into the sunset. Uh, a senior reviewer for Amazon uh, said, I could only wish that all the books I have read were as good as uh, Tom Mack's book. The president of the Kansas Federation of Republic Women said, this is the best book I've ever read. Kirkus Review uh, called it compelling. Midwest Book Review said, this is an exceptional read, great story and history all wrapped in one. The best-selling author, Nancy Picard, said, Tom Mack brings the accuracy of a story and the insight of a novelist to a dramatic and entertaining story. Um, what, uh, what I can tell you about this music on uh, Beethoven is that uh, the Oath of Joy bring, is, brings a lot to me because it's a, it's a uh, music of friendship, of, of brotherhood. 
And if you translate it to the Christian version of that, which is joyful, joyful, which is at the very end when Jessica dies, uh, Emma uh, sings this music to her. Uh, uh, thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed, wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou art our Father, Christ the brother, all who live and love are thine. Teach us how to love each other. Lift us up to the joy divine. So that's, that's the end of my story about Angel of Sunset, but now I'm open up to questions from you or comments. Yes. Tom, thank you very much for, uh, for sharing your insights. Uh, you mentioned Governor Stubbs, and uh, I wonder to what extent uh, his wife was an influence on uh, his position on the women's suffrage movement. His wife? Correct. I, I kind of missed something there. I mean, whose wife? I... Governor Stubbs' wife. In other words, they were basically occupants here in Lawrence of the uh, Stubbs Mansion on West uh, West Hills. Uh, Governor or Teddy Roosevelt came to visit in 1910, and I suspect that Governor and Mrs. Stubbs uh, began their uh, combined efforts to, to use their influence with the Progressive Republican Party to oh. uh, to change the course of history between 1910 and, and 1912. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, it, I'm not sure I can comment on that because I don't know enough about the politics that went before that, but I, I do know that the, uh, there was uh, quite a shift between the Democrat Party and Republican Party in terms of suffrage, but uh, movement of suffrage. At one point, uh, the Democrats were very much against the uh, suffrage movement. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, I've told you about George Francis Train. He was a Democrat, but he was, a, he was ostracized. They, they, they didn't believe in him. He, he, he was like not welcome with the Democratic Party, and yet he supported the women's suffrage movement. Uh, and at some point, in, uh, the Republicans began to shift towards that, uh, towards support of it. So it's really, it went back and forth. I'm not sure I can really uh, talk about the politics because they, neither one had a one side or the other offer. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's. As long as you write an epilogue. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do have an, by the way, I do have an epilogue in this book, which is about the fact that what would happen if, what would happen if men uh, were treated the way women were? What if men had, didn't have any rights? What would happen? Would, would men say, okay, that's all right, I'll, I'll suffer for 144 years and maybe eventually I get the right to vote? I mean, I don't think so. I think it would be men would, would take umbrage at this. And I mentioned this in here. I said, well, let's turn tables around. Let's see what would happen. Hi. I really enjoyed this presentation. Did you, were you influenced by Sophocles and Antigone in any way? Yeah, Sophocles is this, writes Antigone, Antigone is a female who's disobedient to the state, and she's um, uh, killed because of her disobedience. Did I'm you, having a hard time. I'm going to put some microphone or what? I can't. Why? I don't know. Maybe you can. What's wrong? Uh, I'm just a little bit Have you, were, are you familiar with Sophocles and Antigone? And were you influenced by Antigone when writing your women's suffrage stories about women? I mean, you're a male yeah. writing about women, and Sophocles is a man writing about a woman. Oh, yeah. So these, these parallels, like, were you, why, why are you writing about women instead of men? Why, why, do, why is your protagonist a woman? Well, you know what it is? It's because Jessica Radford, my fictional character, because I, I felt she, she's such a strong character to me. She's three-dimensional. I mean, ever since I wrote my first book, uh, Sissy, she, was, she came so alive. She's, she's more, more real to me than my own wife is. I mean, I have to say that. But she was three-dimensional. She's, she's real. I know what she looks like. I could, I could talk to her. I know what she'd say back. And I know what she, how she'd feel about this. And I felt, she felt so strong about this movement that I had, I had to write about it. And initially, I said to myself, I don't know what to write about the suffrage movement. I know nothing about it other than the fact you know, they didn't have the right to vote. So I plowed into the research. And when I plowed in research, I was stunned. I didn't know that they had some of them. There were so many things going on with the behind the scenes that you know most of us, uh, maybe that get a superficial idea, don't know. You know, I didn't know about the, the outrage at the at the um, prison and what how they suffered. I didn't know that. I didn't know that some women almost died in prison. I didn't know that that uh, Wilson was a stubborn fool that he didn't even re realize this. And I, all these things were coming to the surface that I so I was shocked. I'm said to myself, I'm glad I wrote about this. this is, I mean, I'm, I know I'm a man, it's probably weird, a man writing about a woman, but to, to me, I had to write this. Well, why can't you take the male point of view and the man be the antagonist of the male um, female villain? Why did you, why did you have that heroine? Why did you have the heroine instead of uh, the male villain? I just did. I, the woman was... Why, 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 why didn't you, what, 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 what
because the woman was real to me. Jessica was real to me. She was a strong woman. I had a right from her point of view. By the way, if, if you want a, a signed book for me, I do have a, a books out there that I'll be happy to sign for you if you uh, are interested. But I don't know. I mean, she was just real to me. She was a three-dimensional, and I had to write about it from her perspective. I was Jessica. When I was writing this book, I felt like I was Jessica writing this book, if that makes any sense. I have <clears throat> two questions. The first is, can you give me the date that the constitutional amendment for women's suffrage was passed in the state of Kansas? And secondly, I'm wondering if you ran across a woman named Annie Diggs, who yep. lived here in Lawrence and, as I understand it, was involved with the Anna suffrage. Is that Annie, Annie Diggs. No, I don't think I don't think I read. That doesn't ring a bell to me. Okay, I forgot your first question. <laughs> first question was, can you give me the date that the constitutional amendment for women's suffrage was passed in the state of Kansas? The, the date? Uh huh. That was November something of uh, 1912. On uh, November 12th, something November something. I don't remember the exact date. Okay, thank you. I'd have to look that up, but I know it's like late in the late fall. I think it was November of 1912. Uh, Tom, when uh, you were distributing dictionaries to the fourth grade elementary schools as part of the Lawrence Breakfast Optimist Club, you continued to come back to the uh, four points on your <coughs> oh, yeah. chart. I thought that that was a, a very moving subject to, to introduce this um, disparity uh, in the elementary school program as part of the uh, the fourth grade dictionaries. Was that mm -hmm. something, my question is this, is was, were you already at work on this book at the time that you were distributing the dictionaries or was that a catalyst for your, uh, uh, actually, your interest? Actually, I, I worked on this book four years ago. As I, so I was still an optimist that I was working, but I don't know if the dictionary project had anything to do with my thoughts about that. I just, uh, uh, I, was, I was interested in the suffrage movement four years ago when I started writing the book and uh, it took me that long to actually get the book out. Uh, I actually had two agents, both agents loved the book, and one agent couldn't get anywhere with it, and the second agent couldn't get anywhere with it. It was just like the, like the mainstream press in New York is just so rigid, you know. Uh, they're saying, I don't think I can sell more than 20,000 copies of this book, so I'm sorry. I have to pass it up. Well, what's wrong with 20,000 copies, you know? No, we gotta sell about a half a million before we are interested. I mean, you know, the, the, the mindset in New York and, and Main Street is so out, far out of touch. There's a great deal of interest in this subject, you know? I mean, when to come to Kansas and, and check it, look around. Come, come, go to Nebraska, go to Iowa, go look at the Midwest. Get out of your office in New York and come over here. There's a lot of interest in this subject. Do you, are you interested in ever writing nonfiction, or are you strictly fiction? Oh, I, I like nonfiction. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking I could write a a book about Kansas, uh, Kansas suffrage as a nonfiction book sometime, if I have the energy to do that. So, I mean, uh, you're, you're, like, it's better to get news that you told us you're very packed full of information. You have so much information on nonfiction. So, like, it seems like you could just... Oh, I could. Really I could. I got, boxes full of, I got boxes full of sources. I could write a nonfiction book. I have yeah, lots I of... Like, your sources, like, you pointed out your sources and the back of the book. Oh, yeah. It's just that, it, it, like I said earlier, I just want to make it interesting. I want to make it a page turner so people will want to read it. I don't want to, I read a, I read a, like I said, I read a nonfiction book on the, on the subject and I was bored to tears. I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to bore people because it can get boring. Right. You know, you got to make it interesting somehow. Uh, I, I read a, by, by the way, I read a nonfiction book recently which was very good, uh, uh, Killing Lincoln. I didn't think I'd like it. And I read it and I said, geez, I can't, can't put this book down. I mean, I just, you know. Uh, is I already were familiar with the assassination because I wrote, I wrote about the assassination in all parts together, but this one was mind-boggling because it was totally nonfiction. But I kept turning the page so I can see what happens next. You know, I was. I mean, so you could. Any, any women in this in this period of history like they're they're being repressed and did they try to assassinate the president like 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 uh, Lincoln freed the slaves and because of that they assassinated for they assassinated him. Were there any like violent, they like protested, you said, and they picket the president, but were there any like violent attacks against the president? Oh, there were, there were, uh, there were quite a few conspirators that wanted to kill the president. It was a matter of who and when. Uh, 
Uh, matter of fact, uh, the uh, President uh, Lincoln I had a strong feeling that he's going to be assassinated. You know, within, I think he thought about within a week or two he's going to be assassinated. He just felt that. In, in fact, he told his wife about the fact that you know, this may happen, and she didn't want to hear it. I don't want to hear that. You know. But he, he just knew it was going to happen. Uh, I hope I gave a good talk. I don't know. I, some people walked out of here maybe because they were bored silly, but I hope, I hope it was okay. And I uh, want to entertain you as well as uh, show you some things that could be of interest to you historically as well. Uh, thank you.